Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the first episode of Tracing Postmodernities, which is a series that the Dutch architect Job Floris has uh, curated for the Architecture Foundation and um, is, enjoys support from the, the, the Dutch Embassy in London. Um, and the uh, ambition of the series is really that we're going to be looking at the way that the postmodern discourse played out in both the UK and in the Netherlands um, from the early 70s through to around about the early 1990s. Um, we are going to have um, a number of um, interviews in the series with practitioners who were active um, in both countries during that time period, um, and including kind of Dixon Jones and uh, today's speaker, Piers Goff. Um, and from the Netherlands, um, Carol Weber and Jeroen Sutters um, are going to be speaking. Um, and we have asked um, a number of different guest interviewers to uh, pitch the questions. Um, and today's session, I'm delighted we're going to be handing over to uh, Daisy Froud, uh, who um, kind of teaches at the uh, Bartlett and has a practice which has got a strong focus on community consultation around kind of sites of significant urban change. And uh, Sam Jacob, uh, now director of Sam Jacob Studio, former founding director of FAT, um, with a very wide ranging practice that kind of extends um, from kind of uh, exhibition design through to um, the design of architecture. Most recently, uh, his own very spectacular house, uh, which is uh, the scaffolding has just come off um, in, in Hoxton. Um, Daisy, Sam, um, I'm going to um, hand over to you and you could say a little bit about, about peers. Yeah, well, so we thought we, yeah, Daisy and I have been, have been, um, have been immersing ourselves in the, the ancient history of, of CZWG. And I think, I guess our questions really go straight to the, to the beginning. So um, mm -hmm. what we've read about that is you're hanging around at the AA, being taught by P. Cook, doing deals in the corridors, uh, uh, snaffling a phone in some way, and um, kind of setting out on some, some early um, projects for uh, groovy shops, mm -hmm. but also, I guess, like formulating a, uh, an idea of, of kind of, I suppose, like pop architecture, in a sense. So I wondered if you could take us back to, to that era, what you were fighting against and what you were four and all of those kinds of things. Yeah, um, yeah we, all four of the founding partners were at the AA together starting in 1965. And um, there was a, a, a sense when we arrived, which we didn't want to be like even the year before us, let alone the tutors or, or modernism or whatever, that uh, uh, somehow, perhaps it was having Janet Street Porter as one of the students um, and uh, a feeling that there was a better world, a more exciting and interesting world, uh, which she knew about, which was pop art, pop artists and so on. So our, our um, attitude was really that architecture should be more like, sort of reflect more on sort of clubbing and things that were happening in London, the swinging 60s, rather than the sort of uh, uh, follow on of modernism. Now, Peter Cook was up there in the fifth year, sort of beckoning um, and while we were in the first year. Uh, but we loved his stuff, but we thought it was a waste of time if you didn't actually build it. Um, you know, what we wanted to do was actually build this shit, uh, pop stuff. And so we uh, proposed in our, in our early years buildings that were in some ways quite conventional and w could be built, um, but also reflected um, a notion of a world that was susceptible to something much more fun than the standard architecture of the time. All our tutors wore uh, corduroy um, because this was the rough shuttered concrete of 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 wear of of men's wear and and sometimes women's wear. We had Eldred Evans as one of our tutors, and they were great. Um, they were absolutely terrific because they recognised there was something going on, and they didn't ask us to be like them. 
um, unlike many tutors in many schools most of the time, um, they were much more interested in what we thought the future might be. And the, the main thing they did was toughen us up by, um, by making us argue for our case and to be a forthright about what we wanted to do um, and to sort of give us um, some kind of basis for, for, for our work uh, that could be argued through a sort of logic, uh, which we found quite, you know, really useful. Um, however, they were sort of a mixture of appalled and amazed by the sort of things we wanted to actually build, which were at once uh, somewhat flippant um, but, uh, and larkish and so on. Um, and our main influences, I think, could be said to be pop art. And what were you, what were you looking at at that time? Because I'm also thinking of, let's say, that, that weird moment where you have the Smithsons as part of the independent group writing things like and, and now we collect um ads and but that never quite let's say manifesting itself in a in what what we might visually recognize as a pop architecture but they were certainly within a scene which was recognizing all of the 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 the, the kind of fun and interest of um and problems let's say of of uh post-war commercialism Yes, absolutely, and the and the pop we liked was that, I suppose, for being produced at the RCA um, up to the time when we arrived at the A, maybe not even concurrent, but already yeah. done um, uh, from Hockney to Alan Jones, um, and there was a big, there was a Stuart Davis exhibition at the American Embassy um, in our first year, which was very interesting to us because this was a 1922-1930s version of pop art, of, of pop art. Um, and, 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 and it was really interesting for us, of course, to go down to St. Martin's, which was just down the road, um, and sort of hang out at St Martin's we went to all the art school dances because art schools seem to us to be uh, glamorous interesting and and in a way not so hidebound as the world of architecture which had this sort of stolid uh, mm -hmm. base of you know you're going to uh, get a job uh, with one of these uh, local authorities or you're going to get a job with um, Louis de Soissons or somebody um, <laughs> um, but we want to somehow not do any of that. So was it through those conversations, that community, that you found your first opportunities to build, to put something in the world? Because we know you were starting off with boutiques and yeah. market shop. By, by good fortune, two of my partners were Jewish <laughs> and had really good North London connections to lots of uh, rag trade people. And they wanted this new thing, the boutique, uh, whether it was in uh, the Walworth Road in South London or in um, South Moulton Street was one of our sort of successful early uh, efforts. And um, that came about during our year, year out, which is after three years of school, um, we were supposed to go out and work for some other architects and learn the trade, um, and we, which we patently failed to do. We, we went across the square at, the, at Bedford Square to some premises owned by the AA, but not much used. And there we discovered a telephone and set up an office. Um, and we did these boutiques. Um, uh, this was Rex and uh, Roger and I. Uh, Nick hadn't at that time joined. Um, and we, so we, we set up shop as uh, yeah, shop designers. <laughs> um, and we so had yeah, some so we early one, success. Yes. We're looking at one Nitwits, which is ziggurats yes. and palm yeah. trees. Yes. Uh, Lasted about three months. Uh, yeah, walk in, it was a walk in Hockney. Um, <laughs> it lasted about three months because the owner called Ellis Fahimian was sent to prison for embezzling all the money from the Irish Linen Bank. Um, he was a very personable man, um, obviously. You have to be to, uh, to be a con man. Uh, and he had a very exciting wife who had a pink Cadillac. And in those days, you could drive down some of Moulton Street. So there was this wonderful pink Cadillac hanging around outside Nitwit. 
while Elis Fahimian came in and said, do you like it, boys? And uh, we would say, yes, we love it. We are doing, and he called it Knitwit, which was rather embarrassing, but there we are. Um, we also did a shop for Mary Farin, who was from uh, Croydon, and she had an E-type Jaguar. Oh, oh, she was wonderful. And did knitwear, which is called Angora, which is made of rabbits, so very soft and sweet and uh, we tried to do her uh, 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 and it, it was published you know in Domus Christ we thought we were, that was it we'd yeah. never look back published in Domus first job fabulous it looks they look um they look like um if, yeah if there's anything they look like it's maybe like Hans Hollein doing shops in in, in Vienna that that kind yes. of, yeah that kind of take uh, the, the, I agree. Um, we it was a uh, you know there was Hans Hollein thing. I'm not sure we'd ever heard of Hans Hollein. However, let's be honest. I mean, we weren't reading architectural magazines. Uh, in fact, we were desperately. The AJ used to come rolled up uh, in a tube, and we never you never undid it. I mean, you wouldn't dream of opening it, and looking in it. It was great though because it was already a log you could put on your fire in your flat. Um, it was already log shaped. It was great. It was terrific. So we were avoiding architecture, we were avoiding other architects. Um, we were looking to almost anything but architecture for influence. So in looking at some of those early projects, you know, from, from our research, you know, it almost yep. seems like that what emerges is an intersection of your interest in pop, some really quite interesting clients, and then some quite intriguing sites. And that those things seem to come together to start to produce these experiments in form. Am yep. I rationalising that correctly? Well, so, yeah, we obviously we we didn't have the most conventional clients. Um, they were individuals, and we did do some projects which probably not you know which went flat on their faces uh, and had quite a tough few years actually when we first left college. Um, and we we weren't weren't immediately very successful uh, and it wasn't until really the whole Docklands thing took off in the early 80s that we found our sort of perfect clients um, who, some of whom were shockingly even younger than us which was <laughs> really something else and uh, and, and 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 great because they really loved our work in a, in a kind of passionate way um, I mean the problem with pop art I think was that it doesn't really accommodate windows very well. Um, you know, it's it's not when you come to put in the windows, things start to look more quotidian um, mm -hmm. and more normal and more like architecture. And there's not much avoiding it. You can make the building look like a camera and have one window in the middle, or maybe another little one up there. But it doesn't go very far. You know, um, so that seemed that's I suppose where we came unstuck possibly or possibly the point was you combine that influence with a kind of love of English vernacular uh, and ordinariness and and crap building and how they're put up and then you combine the two and you get something like Cascades or China Wharf or one of the sort of early buildings that were kind of exciting. Do you think something happen so if, if let's say late 60s early 70s it was individuals on both sides with making a kind of very image friendly kind of like uh, 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 kind of retail experience by the time of by the time of projects like like um, Cascades or or China mm -hmm. Wharf it's not yeah it's not such it's not so straightforwardly pop in the in in the same no. way but there's something about them being so imageable, you know, like so that, you know, they're, they're pop in the sense that they, they're products, they're consumable, they're kind of visually consumable. They go on the, well as, the phone directory. Oh, yeah, yes. right, right, Got right. both phone directories, A to K <laughs> and L to Z. We had both directories at once and they're the most published books in the, in the British language, of course, at the time, um, the London telephone directories. Um, I think the thing about them was that we felt that housing was had been always the anonymous part of the city, the bit which is supposed to be the background wallpaper. And the major buildings are supposed to be civic buildings and supposed to, there's supposed to be a hierarchy 
of importance of buildings. And Resi was right down the bottom. And certainly in uh, sort of um, architectural minds, it was pretty low down. And the, the most successful architects did mm -hmm. glamorous public buildings and so on. So we felt that the zeitgeist was against that, that people were buying apartments uh, might like to have them as recognizable places that they could describe to their friends as being where they lived and people might go oh yeah I know that building and that to us was quite important um, and it you could say it played horribly into the sort of um, Thatcher era um, the Me Too generation um, but uh, no that's the wrong word isn't not Me Too me, me, generation. The me, me generation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for us, uh, the, the, the townscape was getting boring, you mm. know, um, endless uh, sort of blocks of uh, flats, which were just one on top of the other. They had none of the joys of Edwardian, nor the sort of um, sexiness of Art Deco. They had nothing. They were just sort of dreary, sub-modernist kind of... Um, uh, there was an awful lot of submodernist, dreary housing, and housing was the thing we were obviously going to be employed to do. Um, that was the zeitgeist of the time. All public work was falling away. Everything was going private, and uh, so we looked to be, be become really good at housing, and that's and what is, we did. What, is, what, how we got your to be super young there. clients. Yes, they were like, "Yeah, this is it. This is it. This is what we want." More of that, please. Yes, some of them were. Uh, Andrew Wadsworth was famously a T-shirt manufacturer from Manchester who came down to London uh, and went into an estate agent and said, I'd like to buy a, a loft building, please. And they went, we don't have any loft buildings on our books. So he said, uh, well, what's that warehouse over there? They said, well, you can buy the whole warehouse. Um, if you want to, and he, so he bought the whole warehouse and then converted it into lofts at New Concordia Wharf and then China Wharf was next door to that, it was his sort of second development on the site, was this new build China Wharf and he went on to do the circle as well with us and more recently a whole thing in Dorchester. Um, we also had, you know, clients who were a bit older or, or but who, who were sort of mavericks, um, uh, Kentish Homes was one. Yeah. Uh, and they built uh, cascades, but we we did half a dozen schemes before that, um, very sort of B movie schemes before that for them. And it'd be great to hear a little bit more about those schemes, and then you know, progress to the Docklands. Simply because you know you mentioned the term zeitgeist, and it really mm. does seem there. Like I mean, reading about Kentish homes, that they were very ahead of things development wise in their ability. You know, people almost talk about them creating understanding the importance of lifestyle and of finding mm -hmm. these sites. But I think interestingly, so finding sites across East London in which to, to you know, build uh, their housing company, but uh, that they really realized that if they had interesting design quality on those sites, that they would stand a better chance of getting planning within a planning system at the time that was seen as very sluggish. So it seems like an interesting brief for yeah. you coming into that. Yeah, we we sort of partly made the brief. I think I I I actually can't remember why Keith Preston of Kentish Homes came to us in the first place, but he did, and we did uh, um, we did this scheme in Harrogate Road. It was called in the East End, just north of Victoria Park. We did I don't know eight houses, ten houses, um, which one of which Christopher Biggins lives in now, um, and they were pink. <laughs> You know, they were sort of expression of pinkness, uh, but they're quite conventional in many ways. They had a, a double height living room, however, and um, and uh, we we got the planning, and uh, they said we don't thank you. That that's all we need. Just the planning drawings will do us fine. We'll just build them. And so we sent one of our assistants down one day to say, let's see, go down and have a look at how they're getting on with the with the foundations. And he came back and said, foundations. They built them. <laughs> and we were like yes oh yes we love this world it's so quick 
you know, they, they whack them up. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. That was <laughs> the most exciting thing was we thought, you know, it was going to take years to build, but they just, they just whack them up and sold them. Bang. Great. <laughs> and we didn't do any working drawings at all. We just handed them the planning drawings. They just got on with it. Were they very up for you? Because Keith Preston describes himself as a frustrated architect of Kentish. Oh, Were they very yes. up for you expressing, exploring these different mm -hmm. ideas? Yeah, I mean, we did we did Sutton Square, which was why why a square? Well, which houses in London sell for the most? Ones in squares or streets? Well, in squares. Well, let's do a square. You know, I mean, it was like, <laughs> uh, yeah. There was there was a, it was uh, there was a kind of insouciant kind of um, a bloody mindedness and 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 kind of uh, what Peter Cook used to say. You know, this will annoy them. <laughs> them being anybody you care to think would be annoyed you know yes, the activists class war particularly targeted the kentish home schemes didn't they as as being mm. yuppie yeah i'm sure they did <laughs> um but interestingly Sutton square for instance was clt you know um wasn't actually i think it was um no it was it was a balloon frame it was it was it was, it was timber frame housing mm -hmm. and they couldn't get anyone to cut the dutch gables out in in the industry so they had to go to a sixth form college uh, down the road and get them to cut out the uh, the dutch gables because they had curves you know it's too too tricky for builders <laughs> and then we had this idea to put a single classical column um mm -hmm. by the entrance to two houses so for, for every two houses there's one classical column it was a bargain, you know, it was a bargain for the builders, I mean, but everybody felt they got themselves a classical column, but actually there were only half the number that there were houses. So builder loved it. Kentish Homes loved it. They were queuing around the block. I mean, they really were queuing around the block for that um, overnight uh, queuing to to when when um, Alan Selby sold those uh, people were holding onto his jacket sleeve you know they would not let him go until they were right that punch. yeah it was a it was an incredible um it's a hot world at that time this is a kind of mania though right this is 80s boom yes not yeah absolutely boom we were part like of a boom you know Halifax um, advert easy like Sunday morning yeah nipping out to the cash point yeah the cat no, we probably started a whole, we we're probably part of the start anyway of a yeah. whole uh, despicable thing. But at the time, we were just trying to put nice buildings into the world. And those are not great. Let's be honest, you know, those schemes are not uh, earth shattering, but they're a good learning ground for, um, for, for, you know, trying to make the interior of the house is interesting, um, trying to make funny, you know, some slight differences, and but also to have this inordinately cheerful kind of attitude to it, um, which uh, uh, up to them, we felt other people weren't doing. They were being overly, overly serious in architecture. So one thing, one thing I wanted to ask you about. So, I mean, if you, you, you kind of, I guess you knew you were in that moment and maybe had some misgivings about the general overall scenario as well as enjoyment of what that was enabling or offering mm. up to you um because in some senses you know if you think of pop there's often a kind of there's a lot of enjoyment in pop art but there's also mm. a kind of critique as well yeah if you think of uh postmodernism which is a thing we're we've been sort of asked to, yeah, to think about is, <laughs> it's, sort of, it's like very theory theory heavy Mm -hmm. critique yep. Of, yep. of late capitalism etc mm. can you can you sort of read that in your own work so of course it's it's fun but is there perhaps mm. something else it would be nice can to you... think so it'd be nice <laughs> to think we had depth and thought but in fact we were just running around town uh we were trying i think funnily enough we were trying in the 80s to do what pop what rock music had done in the 60s, which is be uh, uh, popular, but also extremely good. Um, you know, uh, the Rolling Stones, you know, lasting music, and but incredibly strong and exciting and all those things. And we would have loved to have 
made architecture that was that exciting, that interesting. And quite honestly, the, the politics of the time were, um, we almost, we didn't really have time for the politics of the time. I know that sounds ridiculous, but we were, in, we became complete architects insofar as we never did go out and have fun after that. We just went to work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we became, I suppose, the work became the fun. The work became our entire world. And like many architects, we sort of buried ourselves in what we were doing and not paying too much attention to everything else, but enjoying the fact that we were allowed to put up buildings on the Isle of Dogs and uh, even, and, um, in Bristol, you know, and other places, um, and Janet Street Porter's house in Britain Street, these were absolutely exciting things to be doing, and somehow were our contribution, and we felt we were contributing to a London that was uh, had some of the sort of joy of of the sixties of swinging London. Eight, there was a sort of swinging eighties in in the visual arts uh, uh, as well as architecture. Related to the question Sam asked, Piers, you know, you said you're kind of aware of the politics, but not you know, particularly engaged explicitly mm. with it. Yep. Of course, another side of, of postmodernism, and the one that maybe I come more through, is this focus on thinking about the end user, the person who's going to be living in or inhabiting the buildings. And I know you're doing speculative housing on the on the whole in this stretch. Mm. Yeah. But at the same time you're clearly thinking about what will market with the developer you seem to be thinking about what will market how much was that character of the person who might be moving into these developments part of the thing that was shaping your your form the way that you were organizing space yeah we were very keen on um obviously on the uh, livability of squares in Notting Hill Gate, uh, the livability of um, of big balconies on on, on apartments, um, and and the and the way in which people would inhabit their living quarters, and also adding in in both cascades and the circle, there are swimming pools. You know, so we were thinking about. Uh, what people now call lifestyle, but it actually in those days was pleasure, you know, just the pleasure principle of what you can have at home and then what you go out into the street and get. Uh, and so uh, the circle had shops and, and so on. So we, we were thinking about how people occupied uh, space, how they enjoyed it, and we gave them big balconies and we gave them, um, you know, shared gardens, which up to that time were, were tended in modernism you shared the garden with the public, which was absolutely unworkable because somebody could ride a motorbike over you when you were sunbathing. And, but in, a, in, a, in separate internal gardens that made them uh, accessible to children uh, playing without danger and so on. So we were very keen on that kind of idea of the, of the resident garden. And we tried to introduce that into many of our schemes long before it was the absolute standard thing to do. So um, I think we pioneered some of that, some of that thinking about the city. Mm -hmm. And then what interested me was that when we marketed the circle, the very first flats to go were the ones that were actually the most noisy, which were the ones behind the blue curve, not the ones down the street that were or the ones that faced just the gardens funnily enough people wanted the image they wanted to be behind this sexy group blue image and those were the first flats to sell and considered the most the, you know the nicest flats even though they overlooked the sort of tar more tarmac than anything else so i was fascinated by that because that's what we thought but hadn't hardly articulated uh, even to ourselves um, but there is some kind of empathy with that particular, with what that particular type of purchaser yep. and pleasure yep. lifestyle imaginer is is want. Yes, I come from Brighton, and the whole point of Brighton is to live in pleasure. It was built as a pleasure city uh, where you went not to work, um, and you didn't go for just for the weekend. I mean, people lived in Brighton with the intention of of just having a pleasurable life. Uh, and I, I can't say that I saw much wrong with that. I, I wasn't, even though I was a workaholic, I wasn't 
Um, I, I, I wasn't asking other people to be workaholics, as it were. And it's always intrigued me, that idea of the architecture of pleasure. Um, and Brighton is, to my mind, the uh, total expression of that. Um, and, and indeed, Peter Cook and I have this theory that all the most jolly architects are born in seaside resorts um, <laughs> and that the rest are all the drearies, you know, basically. They are, I mean, they are very theatrical, again, like both China Wharf and The Circle. I mean, again, mm. in terms of how somebody who isn't an architect or a kind of, you know, a boiled down uh, generic user is reading and experiencing the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are creating those backdrops. And, and if, I mean, I was saying to Sam yesterday, I think a lot of non-architects might not know who CWG are, um, yeah. but if you were asked them to point out like a typical Docklands piece of architecture, it might well be like Cascades or China Wharf, you know, back to the yeah. phone conversation. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's still quite, uh, they're still iconic enough, um, so that people who go through the circle sometimes think um, that it's only recently been built. That's what interests me. It's, they say, well, when did you finish that? Well, you know, we, why didn't I know about it? So, well, we finished it 25 years ago. So that's possibly why you've never heard of it. <laughs> um, and they get a real shock. You know, mm. it's, it's, it, it was supposed to be this terrible witty architecture is going to date horribly mm -hmm. and the, the odd thing is that they've you know they haven't especially dated that's what's so strange to my mind is that although they obviously you can date them and I can date them um, people out there don't necessarily think they're so old you know um, yeah. or out of or out of fashion even um, there is that terrible fear that some some clients have of anything which doesn't look like everything else that it will be out you know it will go out of fashion but the you know good thing about doing things like that is that maybe they're never in fashion in the first place <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's always, nice. somehow yeah. out of out of the cycle um, yeah in some ways it's so interesting to hear you talking about like I guess like demographics, like what it means for the pleasure-seeking 80s apartment dweller, mm -hmm. um, whether that's the same conception of living as it had been in the, you know, the, the 50s and 60s, the sort of the good citizen of the welfare state, probably mm -hmm. very different, very different idea of what those things would be. Also interesting yeah. to hear you talking about the scale of the, the city and how that might be reflected in, you know, within, within something like Cascades or, or whatever. But I wanted to ask you about some, the some opposite end of the scale, things like mm. um, the, the, the log lintels for, for Janet Street Porter, but especially, um, and it, it, uh, it's, it's enjoying quite a moment of celebrity, thanks to, uh, thanks to the, the house opening as a, as a museum, um, mm. is, is Charles Jenks's jacuzzi. Ah, yes. Yes, the upturned... Oh, the biggest things for, yes. The upturned San Carlino dome. Yes, that's right. And I was I was reading that, that you had a session with Charles and his, his slide projector. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, Charlie was great and, of course, a terrific supporter and really good fun. And we were lectured by him at the AA. And he very, very delightfully kept up with us and wanted to be our friend and promote us when he could and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, I particularly got on with him and he commissioned this little jacuzzi, uh, a, a little, you know, square space was set aside and could you please design it? So yes, uh, we went round and I went round and he had all his slides and, and uh, Charlie, the point about Charlie was he'd been everywhere, done everyone, met everyone, met the architects, probably met Borromini um, <laughs> and he had slides of all these Ro Rome churches and he dutifully put them in his slide projector upside down and we just looked at them and thought which would make the best jacuzzi. <laughs> insane maggie found us in his study opened the door saw us with these upside down slides and went oh my god and then just <laughs> closed the door again she's like oh for god's sake um because um, the, the the pantheon would make a terrible jacuzzi yes yes it's yep. the wrong shape isn't it yeah well um, so we, we um, yeah, the Pantheon, with, with the hole would be too small to get your legs down. So um, we had to, we needed a decent 
<laughs> form. And, um, and then I said, well, if we're going to have this, I'm afraid I'm going to have to turn your windows upside down in the house, which Terry Farrell had carefully designed these sort of Art Deco uh, windows, which look suspiciously like Mary Farron. But <laughs> be that as it may, um, we said, I want to turn them upside down. There were four windows. I managed to get three of them turned upside down. Um, not the one on the south elevation, because that was too precious, but the two side ones and the one into the house. Uh, the curve is at the bottom and the <laughs> steps at the top. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was, it was rather pleasing that. And the pendentives all worked out, you know, hmm, all in terracotta. Oh, not terracotta. What's it called? Terrazzo. Terrazzo, thank you. Um, and um, yeah. And I, I, I think probably the only time it was ever used was at the opening party when I sat in it. And, uh, and then Lily Jenks uh, says it was never warm again. They never bothered to heat it again. So it just remained as this sort of ice cold jacuzzi um, preserved in aspic for um, posterity. I mean, I think, um, uh, I, yeah. But I know you've, so I know you've resisted being tired with the, postmodernist brush yes like, like like almost everybody like yes like Robert Venturi I am not and have never been a postmodernist mm. <laughs> like, yeah. um, no. yeah. but doing something for Charles surely that's well not, none of us want to uh, no no architects of course uh, wanted to think anything but the, that they were themselves and, and yeah. that whatever they did came out of their ex own experiences and they didn't want to be lumped in but I mean if any if any if any firm were postmodern it was definitely us I mean we were the epitome of postmodern architecture let's face it I mean those denying it would it was it would, would be ridiculous really because we just were and we fitted the bill and postmodernism came and found us and championed us because it supported that theory we didn't start with that theory we didn't say let's be postmodernists we just said let's try and do pop art oh my god when you do pop art and combine it with vernacular building, you end up with this rather strange amalgam, which, oh, that's postmodernism. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah. So in the sort of fun, like let's say the, the turning of a religious ceiling upside down, the sort of mm. inversion of it, like there's, it feels like there's something, well, it's not quite satanic, but you know, the inversion of the, the inversion of the the, the 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 correct order, but also Duchampian, you know the yeah the, the yeah it's putting, like, your, putting your in the wrong place. It's the urinal, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, it's happy how these ideas just jump into your mind uh, out of the blue, uh, and you, you don't. I, I I was never much a one for theory, so it didn't bother me. I, I, I just thought it was a funny idea. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it once, anyway. <laughs> um, those, I was going to say another one of those funny ideas, you know, like the log lintels, or it's obviously that boat that's disappearing into the bottom of China Wharf. Yeah. And I think, and that's so interesting. You know, you go back, you talk about Wadsworth and the new Concordia Wharf. Mm. Next door. But that building is such a polite piece of restoration, really. You know, there's a there's a bit of colour and there's I think the conservatories on top. But I mean, it predates the LDDC, London Doctrine Development Corporation, being formed by one year. And then right next to it, almost looking like part of the same building, you have a completely different way of turning a warehouse into accommodation. And then yes. the little boat just disappearing into the bottom of it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the boat is Magritte, of course, um, the railway train coming out of the fireplace, uh, although it's not as witty as that, because, of course, the boat, you might find a boat <laughs> on the river, um, perhaps not exactly where it would be at high tide all the time. But um, and um, uh, I, we did the back of the boat out of some sort of perversity rather than the I, don't, I, don't, I can't quite explain why, um, but it gave us a chance to write the name of the builder on it, which mm -hmm. was the great Harry, uh, Harry Neal, the great, one of the great builders. Um, and the, um, I think the, that element was just the, I've managed to make brackets for every single balcony on that building. And then I had to put a balcony somewhere where you couldn't put a bracket, so I was stuck. So then I just thought, well, we'll do this sort of um, object 
uh, that could have been there, uh, this boat. So yes, it was it was a kind of way out of of an illogic of there wasn't a reason to support that balcony, um, which gave rise to doing it. And then the other side of the building, you know, looks like a fluted column to some people, inverse silo to other people. Inverse silo is probably more like it. And but it was all argued as being the windows are twisted towards the view in this curves. Um, and, you know, there were many silos being demolished because nobody could think of reuses for them. And I was very upset about that because I really love those silos more than anything. And um, so I was determined to do a silo building and I was sort of determined to do a polite building in the street. And I was determined to do a Fellini-esque building onto the river and put all three into one building, which is insane. I mean, it broke every rule, which is that the three sides bear very little relationship to each other. <laughs> it's really interesting the way you describe that story, that you've got this problem that you have to resolve, and rather mm. than try to like resolve it in a way that maybe masks the problem, actually taking the opportunity to yep. express it even more. Yeah. Yeah, well, illogic. Uh, lo logic is still a driving force. Uh, you know, you, you, if you invent something, uh, a form that solves all the problems, you hope that it's logical. But if it doesn't quite manage to solve them all, then you may be involved in some illogic. And um, that's where you get the grit in the oyster, you know. It's, it's, it's convenient, it's exciting, yeah. I suppose it doesn't, it's that doesn't happen enough. Yeah, but well, I suppose it's also about, uh, a, a, you know, kind of a, a, an idea of pluralism, right? Like a, a building mm. of three identities that don't resolve. Yes. Or the fact that I think someone's someone was complaining. Maybe it was, maybe it was Peter Cook even complaining that you never really resolved anything into a language, mm. and he's sort of expecting it to. And, <laughs> and clearly, you you know, many of your projects, they may share an attitude, but they don't share a, a design language or an aesthetic. No, no. Correct. Um, which is, a, which is an amazing every... thing to resist over over so many years. <laughs> well, we were determined not to have an oeuvre. You yeah. know how some architects had this sort of oeuvre that everything was sort of of a piece and you could recognise all their buildings because yeah. they're all more or less the same. Like, uh, well, I won't say, but anyway. Um, but we were very much the place, you know, the circumstance. There was... Uh, I suppose context was a word that was had sort of come up more and more in architectural discourse was about context. And so we took it really literally and, and thought that you should do a different building every time. And so these were, I guess, were some I mean, context was a sort of reaction against modernism, right? In a, mm. sort of like, yes, you know, absolutely. The universality of modernism. Yeah. You're exactly right. Context was the sort of... Um, could be seen as sort of small minded um, uh, kind of localism, uh, yeah, all sorts of, there are all sorts of sh sh shitty ways of reading it, but uh, equally it, it's also very inspiring. And, uh, and um, I went once to lecture in, in Australia and they said, do you have any idea how jealous we are of the fact that you can walk down the street and see a Hawksmoor? Mm -hmm. Have you any idea how hollow it is to have so little here to play with, it's so little to react against or with or to follow or, you know, and you guys just don't realize how lucky you are. Context is absolutely thick in Europe and absolutely almost non-existent in Venturiville, um, you know, um, that I suppose obviously there is lots of context in Venturiville, but from their point of view, they were sort of felt we had a richer, we had a richer experience and a much richer uh, locational abilities. Um, uh, and they were, yeah, jealous, basically. Did you feel, so you, if you say you, you sort of, like you came out of a scene, let's say, which mm. is maybe as much social as it was anything else. Mm. Um, but later on, did you feel like, did you feel alone or did you feel like you were, there was a group of you or a scene or how did, yeah. 
we um yeah i mean obviously if you go on with postmodernism past its sell by date you're going to feel a little bit out of the water <laughs> and we've never really thrown it off uh i think i uh, happily uh, we have different characters in the office of course and rex was much more serious architect than me really um uh, a, a much more crafted and much more uh, construction aware and generally um, had a more northern view of the world. Uh, and luckily, you know, that balance was good for us, I think, that and I, I can't help but think that I've become duller as I've got older. I've, my buildings are not quite as colorful as they were. They're not quite as outrageous as they were. Um, they're, they're, they've sort of learned to be to fit in more and be more part of what else is going on in architecture uh, rather than being out front of everybody. Um, uh, I still find the same things funny and I still find the pretensions funny and I still think the London vernacular is the most dreary style that was ever invented um, and is practiced by all the big architects in London. It's terrible but and dreary and what lost opportunities. But for myself, I just try and cook it a bit more, you know, and but then, you know, with, with Egret West down the street, nothing to worry about. You know, they're, they're doing it. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's really interesting looking at your like trajectory across the decades is yeah. you know, you've obviously you know, what happens with the deregulation of planning in the Docklands gives you this tremendous freedom there that seems to intersect really nicely with your enjoyment of play and being able to push things. Mm. Reading the story of you in the practice, it really reminds me, have, have you read the Anthony Pole books, The Dance to the Music of Time, a sort of saga, a great saga of the 20th century. Yes. But it's through the frame of, um, you know, one individual's experience. So you have all these historical events, events almost just sort of passing by characters. Mm. And it seemed that the practice, you know, had these extraordinary intersections. You know, like we're, we're talking about innovation in a playful way in terms of form, but that's drawing on, you know, other things. But typologically, you're present at the birth of all kinds of interesting things, such as you know, the rebirth of the private residential tower as opposed to tower blocks being associated mm -hmm. with um, social housing. And then yep. I was reading that the very first Clerkenwell loft conversion in the 90s in Summer Street, or what you know, mm. Chris Hamnett writing a kind of history of that, you know, says that's that sees at WG with Manhattan lofts, the very first taking of a loft building there and seeing these opportunities yeah that that I, we've totally ignored that haven't we yes yeah, so yeah. <laughs> thank you for bringing that up um <laughs> harry handelsman was one of the uh, financial backers of the circle and he had been to see this uh, building in in, in um, summer street and by i suppose good fortune our office was very very close to summer street so he only had to walk around the corner and say look i've just seen this building come and have a look and um so we kind of got in on the ground floor of that um, and we had another very interesting developer uh, who was a friend of Harry's as well, who sort of encouraged him to use us anyway, and uh, called uh, um, Colin Serlin, who did the Jamestown Road buildings, the glassy ones like this. Um, and we, um, so we got to do Summer Street. And, and th at that moment, the generosity was phenomenal because Harry could pick that building up for almost nothing and offer it out to the market in, in big chunks. Uh, so those lofts were real lofts. They were really sizable, double height, fabulous spaces and, um, and sold raw, you know, great. So we were definitely loved that and we loved doing Soho lofts um, which was another more nitty-gritty one but fun to do and, um, and we yeah we went on to doing lofts with with Manhattan loft uh, we did of course Bankside then right opposite the Tate uh, although uh, uh, Jacques Herzog complained to me that they'd wanted to buy a flat in it while they did the Tate conversion and uh, it was too expensive <laughs> for the Swiss. You could say that, that the, you know, the sort of project of pluralism is full of fun and mm. whimsy and stuff like that, but there's also something really serious about it, right, which is about the acceptance of 
of different languages, um, the ability to include all kinds of different references and um, traditions and so on and so forth. So yeah. thinking about the, the, whether there's, I mean, postmodernism, let's say in a broad sense, has a really bad rap politically. You know, it's like thought of as being the, the architecture of Thatcher and, and Reagan. And it was, that was how, you know, Bob and Denise were, were, mm. were tarred with, 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 with uh, um, you know, being thought of as reactionaries when in fact they were interested in exactly the opposite. But mm. there's, a very positive, you know, there's a very positive and very relevant aspect to postmodern thinking in general, but certainly within architecture, which, which is really, I think, important to recognise. Yeah. And I just wondered whether you had thoughts about what, what is good and what is relevant and what is, let's say, um, useful. I think what's useful is, is the um, plurality of thought that went into our work and the plurality of, uh, of architects now uh, who feel able to, uh, to, 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 to tread their particular paths. And um, one of the most satisfying things, uh, I suppose, in in later life is the number of architects who think of us as having somehow pushed open some doors that they were uh, able to follow through and felt free and felt um, liberated to ignore um, rule, certain rules or certain uh, dictations from above or from their tutors or from the world or from the architectural review that they could ignore all that and they could say well CZ say it's okay to go off and pursue a, a different angle not that they're like us or or did anything like us but they saw us as a kind of um, pl place which allowed uh, and challenged uh, the sensibilities of of architectural discourse and so on. So, I think that's really, really important. Um, what I actually think is that although I was really down on the London vernacular thing in London, there are lots of incredibly delightful buildings being built by different architects, uh, and that uh, they've we've managed to change the whole planning regime of London to invite pleasure so uh, the sort of prettiness of Alison Brooks's work or the um, cussedness of Serge and Bates or whatever it is um, they're getting through planning they're getting through the system and people are really enjoying their work I, I, you know the public are getting off on it and um, so are we all um, Peter Barber look at that I mean Peter Barber incredible work nothing to do with CZWG but just gorgeous things you know gorgeous way of doing housing um, and that all comes out of a postmodern sensibility of a sense that I can pick up bits of the past or bits of Mediterranean or I can you know if it works it works if i can make it work if i can bring it into the the way of british way of life and do it then it's becoming a sort of richer more plural more fascinating place uh and i i must say i i you know i'm i'm quite positive about um architecture at the moment but i do think that climate <laughs> It'll probably reverse out and everybody doing identical work and it will all be unbelievably serious. 